We have some new and exclusive information in this video, so stick around till the end for some fresh facts about some of Nintendo's own N64 titles. Now, let's just jump right in. We love us some Diddy Kong Racing. It's a game with a lot of interesting secrets, like the hidden language option that can be found in the US version of the title. By modifying a small piece of the game's code, a normally inaccessible Japanese language option can be activated, but it isn't exactly a decent option for Japanese players. Rather than actually translating the game's text, all it does is replace the game's text with the word Japanese written in English. Amazing, you can tell they spent an entire five minutes on that one. The game also has another undisclosed feature that was implemented to dissuade piracy, which has been discovered since our last video covering anti-piracy measures in N64 games. When activated, the anti-piracy measure will reduce the traction on some of the surfaces of tracks, which makes them almost completely undrivable. This was only discovered after fans began attempting to decompile the game's code, known as the DKR Decompilation Project, which so far has unearthed some neat little secrets just like this one. While the Nintendo 64 was stuck being seen as a console for kids, thanks to people judging games like Diddy Kong Racing just from the way they look, this did not necessarily mean that every game released for the system was targeting this demographic. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, for example, was generally aimed at young adults and teens, meaning that most versions of the title contain some less than family-friendly content. This content that, at the time, would have turned some heads if parents saw their kids playing it. And when the game was brought to the N64 from the PlayStation, many of these more mature elements had to be toned down either at the order of Nintendo or someone else. These cuts removed things that you wouldn't even bat an eye at in modern games, such as the removal of blood being sprayed from the player when they fail a trick. Developers of the N64 version, Edge of Reality, also altered some of the language and suggestive names of the various gaps found across the title stages, which appear when performing a trick between two set pieces. This includes the Handy Gap, a play on the term handicap, becoming the Spanky Gap. The Long Ass Rail became Big Daddy Rail, and the Holy Shit became Holy Cow. Alterations were even made to Private Carrera's age, in which her profile previously referred to her as barely legal, where now she said to be 41 which isn't even close to an age that you would refer to as being barely legal. Several boards even had their name changed as well, such as the Erector set becoming Yes Mom, Viagra Falls being Thanks Bob, a bit of an odd trade-off there, Manhandler becoming Hot Stuff, Feelin' Blue being changed to Miss Devastation, New Member becoming Crazy Stats, Solid Wood changing to Foxy Lady, and lastly, Skate Hard being changed to skate mean. Game developers are an interesting lot, often dedicated to the job and tiring over a computer on their own, but some have other loves that they hold dear. For the team behind NHL Breakaway 98, it seemed that the developers wanted to express their love as best they knew how. During the game's creation, a decent chunk of empty space was left over for the team to play around with. So, to show some love to their families, a secret slideshow was included in the game's code. In order to view this slideshow, the player would have to insert a specific combination of buttons. The only problem however, is that the devs actually forgot the code that they'd programmed into the game for this to work. So, as a result, the only means of actually seeing this small dedication is through the use of a game shark. Another interesting 64 tidbit again comes from the Donkey Kong franchise. During a 2013 developer commentary Let's Play of Conker's Bad Fur Day, longtime Rare programmer Chris Marlowe shared an interesting anecdote of another Rare N64 classic, Donkey Kong 64. Marlowe told viewers that while working on DK64, developers at Rare discovered a memory leak issue that would occur almost immediately when playing the game, which would lead to the game crashing. Unfortunately, they were unable to root out the reason for this happening before the game's final release, so instead, they were forced to include the game in a bundle with the N64 expansion pack, which inexplicably fixes the issue. There was, there was, a, there was a bug that caused the game to randomly crash that only occurred in the 4 meg only version. They physically, the game just kept randomly crashing and they couldn't find out what it was, so they had to ship with the memory card in it. For free. This story, however, is disputed by another Donkey Kong 64 dev, Mark Stevenson. In an interview in November of 2019, Stevenson claimed that Rare's management had planned to have the game support the expansion pack from very early on, instructing the devs to create the game as such, including quite advanced graphics for the 
the time like dynamic lighting. He went on to say that DK64 did indeed feature a game-breaking bug during development, but it was only an issue on particular N64 hardware and was eventually fixed. He also speculates that the memory leak rumours were born of the two different stories merging over the years. Expansion ports can open up a whole world of discovery with consoles. They add extra functionality, but with that, the potential for abuse. With Morita Shogi 64, a Japan exclusive virtual shogi game, the developers included an additional port in the game's cartridge, which added a function otherwise entirely missing from the N64 console, an RJ11 modem connection port. This port would allow players to connect to a surprisingly now defunct online server, allowing them to play the game against others across Japan. However, this opened up an exploit for the system, allowing a user to use an arbitrary code execution exploit so that they can actually run their own homebrew software. It's worth noting that Morita Shogi 64's cartridge isn't the only modem for an N64. There was also a modem built into a cartridge that worked with the 64DD, giving players access to things like RANnet. However, since the 64DD was produced in limited supply and was never sold outside of Japan, Morita Shogi 64 is by far the cheaper option for the N64 homebrew. Toy Story 2 Buzz Lightyear to the Rescue is fondly remembered as being a pretty decent 3D platformer that wasn't developed by either of the kings of platforming, Nintendo or Sony. The game is remembered by some for another reason, however, as the title found itself in a bit of trouble post-launch, which led to some revisions. Not exactly a massive change, though a noticeable one, is that one of the game's generic enemies was altered for the European release of the game on N64, and all versions on the Dreamcast. The reason for this change is that the enemy's appearance was originally that of a stereotypical Mexican bandito. The character was altered by changing their hair colour to blonde, giving them a white hat, and changing their clothing, essentially changing them from a Mexican stereotype to an American cowboy stereotype. While not changed in the game's original US release, a second version of the game was published in North America which used this model instead. This isn't the only game with a small-scale toy box aesthetic for the Nintendo 64. The other title is, of course, Paper Mario. During Chapter 3 of Paper Mario, there's a segment where the player must evade the area's boss, Tubba Blubber. If Mario is caught, a battle will be triggered and the player is expected to simply flee. However, there are some little known and inventive ways of ending the fight. If the player uses Lady Bo's out of sight move, Tubba Blubber will be confused that he can no longer see Mario and he will leave the fight. But if Lady Bo is out of commission, there's another way that players can trick Tubba Blubber into leaving Mario alone. The Repel Gel item will also make Mario turn transparent and have the same effect as using Out of Sight. But the game has other secrets that are even more obscure. But before we get into those, did you know you can get 10% off eShop codes and games at our own dedicated store? We're not talking about a sponsorship here, this is our own store curated by us and our partners Famehype, who are fully certified to sell Nintendo products and more. So if you want a convenient way to buy store codes and games and help support the show and get 10% off everything you buy, go to store.digunogaming.com or click the link in the description and use code DAS, I'm not going to take that personally, at checkout. That's store.digunogaming.com digunogaming.com code dat. Now back to Paper Mario. In the game's fifth chapter, players will come across a village of Yoshis. One of them will randomly say, the village leader is my friend, but this line is linked to a secret that can only be seen by extracting unused graphics from the game. In game, this Yoshi always hides their hand. However, there are unused sprites of the NPC showing that he and the village leader wear matching friendship bracelets. None of the other Yoshis in the village have these bracelets. We're not entirely sure why Yoshi hides the fact in the final game, but the two Yoshis wearing the friendship bracelets may have been a minor plot point during development. Now, we've probably all wanted to be involved with game development at some point in our lives. And for one young Nintendo Power reader, that wish became a reality. For the release of Turok 2 Seeds of Evil, Nintendo Power Magazine held a Turok contest in which the grand prize winner would have their likeness put into the then upcoming Turok sequel. Juan Gaspar won this contest and was awarded a trip to the offices of Iguana Entertainment where he had his image digitized along with his voice recorded so that he could be injected into the game. However, seeing his face involves some effort with the player having to enter a cheat code, here's Juan in the N64 port or Yokiero Juan 
in the PC release. By doing so, Quan's face can appear on the game's life force tokens. Imagine going over to a friend's house in the 90s and putting a cheat code in a game and suddenly your face is everywhere throughout. It would have blown their tiny little minds. There are more password-based secrets in the Turok franchise, including its progenitor, Turok Dinosaur Hunter. The game features numerous cheat codes with a variety of functions, including your usual extra lives and invincibility, etc. That said, there are a few in the game that are less cheat codes and more of fun hidden Easter eggs. If the player enters the password SNFFRR, it will activate Disco Mode. The environmental textures of the stage will begin to cycle through a variety of colors. Enemies will no longer attack the player because they'll be too busy enjoying the show and having a little dance. The password LLTHCLRSFTHRNB will turn on Purdy Colors. This will also alter the colors of the textures, though this time it's a static multicolored effect. The code DLKTDR will put the game in pen and ink mode. This will render the game in what is essentially wireframe mode. All of the models, including the enemies, will be displayed as wireframes. Lastly, entering the code CLLTHTNMTN engages Quack mode, a poke at the popular first-person shooter Quake. This mode disables all of the game's animation interpolation, significantly reducing the game's perceivable frame rate. It also disables all of the texture filtering and particle rendering, features which were important selling points of Turok and a lot of what set it apart from the id software PC powerhouse. There are more secrets in the world of Turok, but some aren't even found in a Turok game itself. The lead character of the games, the dinosaur hunter Turok, has a fully playable character model in the code of the wrestling game WWF Warzone. Found in both the PS1 and N64 versions of the game, the character is completely inaccessible without the use of a cheat device. While playable, he isn't exactly an original fighter, with Turok making use of The Rock's moveset and entering the fight to one of the CAW entrance themes. Another unplayable character can be found in another title under the WWF banner, WWF No Mercy. While not a full character model, it's possible to use a Game Shark device to unlock an additional face texture for the Wrestler Edit mode. The face of The Big Show, a famous wrestler who was originally intended to make an appearance in the game, though was removed during development as a result of his contract at the WWF expiring. The name of the texture is RROR, -R -R, likely meaning error. Another hidden feature in the game was a piece of functionality that was removed during the late stages of development, which would have allowed the player to create their wrestler in the N64 game and transfer them over to a Game Boy Color version of the title through the use of the N64 transfer pack. However, as a result of the Game Boy Color version of No Mercy being cancelled, this was of course removed, though the menu can still be accessed by using GameShark codes, from cut characters to an entirely cut game. Toon Panic is a 3D arena fighter that never received a release. The title was cancelled as a result of its developer, the aptly named Bottom Up, finally for bankruptcy in the year 2000. This isn't the only interesting part of the game's existence, however, as despite not being published, a prototype build of the game was released online in an extremely early state the first time most people even found out about his existence at all. Some characters in the game aren't selectable, and several characters use a number of Final Fantasy VIII character portraits as placeholder images. But an entirely unused image can also be found in the game's data, which appears to be a small drawing of the Nintendo lead, Mario. Whether this would have ever been used in the game is unknown, but it is at the very least not used at any point in this early prototype build. It seems this episode of Did You Know Gaming has a very face-oriented undertone, as our next piece of trivia is also about a face. Naturally, with the advent of 3D graphics and 3D worlds, the prospect of soaring through the skies was one that many wanted to realize. Pilot Wing 64 took this idea and ran with it, or flew with it rather. The unusual cult classic of course has its own little secrets and easter eggs. It's already well known that it's possible to fly into the mountains where Mario's head can be found in a similar vein to Mount Rushmore. Shooting at this head a few times will change its appearance from Mario to Wario. But this isn't the only face which can be found hidden in the game. One made all the more difficult to see as it was removed from international localizations of the game. Inside a cave found on Everfrost Island, it's possible to find a rock with a somewhat familiar pattern. 
While it's not known whether this is intentional or not, the rock has what appears to be the face of Jesus Christ as seen on the Turin Shroud, a linen cloth which bears the negative image of a man believed to be Jesus Christ. As we said, regardless of whether this is intentional or an unfortunate coincidence, it was ultimately removed from international release. From the face of Jesus Christ to the face of a clock. Like the clock at the center of the plot of Majora's Mask, a story about the passage of time and the passage of the person through time, Link. In an article found in the September 2000 issue of Nintendo Power, the writer for the game's English language script, Jason Leung, claimed that the South Clocktown business scrub's allusion to his work keeping him away from his wife was actually an intentional nod from the developers at Nintendo of Japan about their own tribulations during the production of the title. Some of these tribulations were likely in trying to create such a massive adventure with limited console resources. The N64 isn't exactly a powerhouse. And a result of this can actually be seen with the lag spike that occurs during the Giants cutscene. When the game was released on the Nintendo Switch, a conscious effort was made to replicate this lag spike intentionally in how the game is emulated. This lag spike was introduced to simulate the N64's own stuttering performance, as if it had not simulated. An error occurs in the scene in which the cutscene will finish before the background music has had a chance to catch up. This error actually happens in the Wii and Wii U Virtual Console versions of Majora's Mask, which didn't bother to emulate the lagging. The lag ultimately extends the scene by about 8 seconds, which you might not notice if you're not some sort of speedrunner. Nothing says that this is a Nintendo video quite like Mario. That's right, Mario is a Nintendo series, and a game in that series is Super Mario 64. Mario 64 practically sold the console alone, with the tender love and care that went into the title being abundant. But there was so much love that some of it went unused. Leftover code in the game's data reveals that there was considerable effort put into the tiny role of Mips the Rabbit, who only appears once throughout the entirety of the game's original release. The unused code relates to the player throwing Mips, with a unique animation of him falling onto the floor and then getting back up. In the final game, this animation isn't ever seen, with Mario carefully setting Mips down without being able to throw him at all. During development, Mips was also a completely different color, being pink instead of yellow. This stage of Mips also had another unique ability, with his head being able to turn a full 180 degrees, in a similar fashion to an owl, so that he would have been able to visibly see Mario as he approached from behind. Other changes from early versions of the game can also be found, such as a secret alcove located in Womp's Fortress, which in the final game contains a one-up mushroom. This well-hidden secret was originally not supposed to reward the player with an additional life, but rather a power star. It's believed that this was changed due to the obscurity of its location, as it would have been pretty unlikely for players to stumble upon it, and may have left many frustrated that they couldn't find all 120 stars. Now these next few facts are the all new ones we talked about at the start of this video, and they're a bit risque. 1080 snowboarding was a pretty solid game, and was sort of like Nintendo's SSX, but years before SSX even existed. It's similarly oozing with style, as well as some pretty hip and edgy content for a Nintendo game, but it seems Nintendo's developers in Japan took it a little bit too far during development, and two phrases of a sexual nature had to be cut after Nintendo staff in America got a chance to sample the game. We talked to a former Nintendo localizer and graphic designer, Jim Warnell, about his experience bringing the game to the West, who told us, uh, the, the quirks I came across in 1080 were all audio quirks, and they were they were things that wouldn't pass ESRB uh, standards um, at least 24 years ago. I, I remember on the the character select screen with the music playing, um, there was. Uh, there was an audio of a woman in the background saying, give it to me, give it to me good. Uh, don't want your bad luck, baby. Uh, so they had to remove that. As for the second phrase of a sexual nature, Jim told us that in one of the races, there was some audio that triggered as the player crossed a bridge, and it sounded a lot like the announcer was repeating what sounded like the word homosexuality, just over and over and over again. 
Jim heavily emphasized that he didn't know if the announcer was actually saying homosexuality, but they weren't taking any chances and had to ask Nintendo's developers in Japan to take it out. But we've yet to say what Nintendo's Japanese developers' biggest blunder was. There's a character in the game called Dion Blaster, who's a black man from the UK. His name is only Dion Blaster because Nintendo of America had to ask Nintendo to change his name. What was it originally, you ask? Leroy Blackman. It was changed for, quote, obvious reasons. Another N64 classic is Star Fox 64, or Lilac Wars as it was known in our neck of the woods. If the player takes the game's hard path to go to Planet Aquas and complete the level, Peppy will say, Slippy's not such a screw up after all. And then Slippy will rebut with, thanks a lot, Peppy. But Slippy's clapback was originally a lot harsher with him saying, bite me, old man. This line was written by Nintendo of America, recorded in English, implemented into the game, but later removed. This fact again comes from Jim Warnell, who told us that he went on a business trip to Japan during localization, and when he came back to the States, the line was just gone. Apparently, someone else at NOA thought it was a bit much. But the Japanese version arguably goes even harder than this, which makes the censorship seem fairly unnecessary. In the Japanese game, Peppy will say, even Slippy can be useful sometimes, and then Slippy responds by saying, shut up, old man. After telling us about this story, Jim left us with another cool little tidbit. Fox McCloud's signature at the end of Star Fox 64 was written by Jim himself. Did you also know there's about 30 Pokemon games that never came to the West? To see what they all are, check out this video on screen. And as always, thank you for watching.